So hello, my name is Alejandro Sanchez Alvarado. I am an investigator with the Starrs Institute for Medical Research, as well as the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And today we're going to be talking about uh, this cryptic title called Dying Young as Late in Life as Possible, Tissue Homeostasis, Regeneration, and Stem Cells, and Why Dying Young as Late in Life as Possible. This actually underscores a very fundamental principle of life that uh, is broadly manifested in every multicellular organism, irrespective of whether they're plants or they're animals. And you can find it in the most common places as well as in the most inhospitable places. So I'm going to take an extreme and take you to a very inhospitable place um, that is uh, in South America. Uh, this is uh, a map of uh, the globe of Earth, of planet Earth, where we live. Let's say we're going to take a trip from North America down to South America. And what you're going to see here is that we're going to go to the northern part of Chile, between um, the borders of Chile and, uh, and Peru. There's this tremendous desert that spans south and north of the coast of Chile called the Atacama Desert. And the reason why I want to take you here is because there is a very interesting manifestation of life uh, that inhabits these incredibly desolate uh, plains of, uh, of uh, landscape that do something uh, really, really uh, remarkable. And it's these plants right here. Its scientific name is Azorella compacta, and you're looking at one such specimen. And what I'm going to do is that underneath this picture, I'm going to draw a timeline. And there it is, starting from time zero and uh, going all the way to, you know, where I'm standing, essentially. And what I'm going to do with this is illustrate uh, something that's truly remarkable about uh, multicellular life. So I want to start by saying that uh, when the first uh, extrasolar planet was discovered in 1988, this plant was happily growing and existing on the plains of this inhospitable place called the Atacama Desert. Now that would make the plant approximately, you know, 30 years old or so, right? So you can go back a little bit more in history and uh, go to the first time that an atomic bomb was detonated on the planet. This is in 1945. And botanists estimate that that plant was actually living there just fine. You can go further. You can go all the way back to 1842 which is about the first time that Darwin was beginning to write down and think about his theory of evolution. And this plant has, is believed to have been growing and living already out on the Atacama uh, Desert. That makes the plant already, you know, close to 150 to 200 years old. Now, that's pretty remarkable for a single uh, multicellular organism, but it gets even more uh, intriguing because if you go even further, all the way back to 1609, when Galileo first aimed a telescope at the moon, it's believed that this plant was still growing on the Atacama Desert. That's already 400, 420 years or so. So uh, that makes it already uh, pretty astonishing. But you can go even further than that. You can go all the way back to 1347. The continent of America had not been discovered. Uh, the Black Plague was decimating most of European countries. And this plant was growing as if nothing was happening in the rest of the world. 1347. This plant was already living for several centuries. It's a se several century old plant. And you can go all the way back to the Summa Theologica, which was written by Thomas Aquinas in 1273, and who might be somewhat responsible for most of these events that uh, happen uh, a posteriori later on. But this plant is estimated to have been uh, growing on this uh, plains of the Atacama Desert. In fact, and I'm going to stop because I don't want to go all the way back, but you can actually sum up the uh, rise and fall of the Roman Empire, and the plant was still growing on the Atacama Desert. So this is even before there is uh, civilization. Uh, essentially, an organized uh, society, this plant was growing, you know, completely impervious and completely, you know, um, ignorant of everything that was going on around it. The key thing here is that this plant is estimated to be at least 3,000 years old. That is an incredible astonishment, uh, incredible and astonishing uh, um, uh, phenomenon that is manifested by plants. But it's not just plants, it's also a lot of other organisms. So why can this plant live for 3,000 years? So the fundamental reason why it can't live for 3,000 years is because there is a key principle in its biology that allows it to survive and thrive, uh, essentially impervious to the passage of time. If you look closer at this plant, it looks um, like a series of rosettes. You can see those all floating around here. They all seem to be organized in a series of Fibonacci series. So uh, I'm going to increase that so you can take a look at it. So you can see these really nice little rosettes, uh, you know, essentially organized all around each other. In the center of each of these rosettes lies a very interesting population of cells in a structure called the apical meristem. And this apical meristem is populated by stem cells, which we're going to be talking about for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. These stem cells are responsible for the production of every single cell type 
that is found in this particular plant. Uh, the colors, uh, the different functions for breathing, for respiration, for capturing sunlight, roots, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of those actually come from stem cells that are organized in these meristems, in these plants. Now, you and I clearly don't live for 3,000 years. I don't even know if I want to live for 3,000 years if, if I think about it. Uh, but we do some really remarkable things that are uh, also equally uh, astonishing. And I'll give you an example. So here's um, Ledas. This is painted by Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, I like these uh, drawings that he was doing of a human body and human anatomy at the time. But what I want to tell you about this is that it is uh, being estimated that in a single day, you and I will replace and will lose and replace anywhere between 50 to 70 billion cells. Now, these are American billions. These are not metric billions, because if there were metric billions, we would just disappear. But 50 to 70 billion cells. Now, if you do the math, this is happening every single day, and you add how many cells you lose every single day for 365 days, what happens is that in a year, each and every one of us would have produced and at the same time eliminated a mass of cells that is equal to our entire body weight. Now, think about it for a second. I mean, I woke up this morning, you know, getting ready to come here today and give you this presentation, and I recognize myself in the mirror, even though between today and yesterday, I lost 50 to 70 billion cells. If this loss of cells was completely uncontrolled, there was absolutely no way that you and I could grow to live for 80 years if we're lucky, and maybe beyond that. Uh, but that is a, a really uh, uh, remarkable thing to think about, that we every day are losing this many cells and still retain our external appearance and our form and function, that our parents can recognize us, that we can recognize our children, is truly uh, remarkable. And the reason why this happens is because there's a process that allows us to um, grow and to uh, thrive through a long period of time. Uh, this process of longevity, which is underpinned by a series of uh, mechanisms, which we're going to discuss in the next few slides. So what I would like to discuss for the next few slides is the following. How is the long-term maintenance and repair of our bodies maintained? How is this done? How could it be that from a single cell after fertilization, we can grow to you know, be human beings, and after birth, continue to grow, and after we finish all our growth, we continue to live for several decades after that? How do we maintain uh, this uh, anatomy? How do we maintain our form and function without dropping dead like flies? And it should be happening, but it's not happening. It's an incredibly robust and a stable system. So I would like to cover four topics. First is the cellular agent that appears to be mostly responsible for the maintenance of this form and function throughout life, which are called stem cells. And if uh, you've been spending the last 10 years playing Minecraft, you would not know what stem cells are. So I'm sure you've heard uh, what stem cells may or may not be. Secondly, you know, what is tissue homeostasis, which is a fundamental uh, process that allows us to retain this form and function. We'll talk about that. The third and penultimate uh, uh, topic I want to discuss is regeneration. And there's a difference between tissue homeostasis and regeneration, and we'll discuss that as well. And then finally, how can we study these very complex processes, these stem cell functions, the functions that allow the stem cells to produce all of these other uh, uh, situations, tissue homeostasis and regeneration problems. So let's start with what are stem cells, which is topic number one. So stem cells are famous because they've been on the press, and they've been discussed everywhere, and uh, everybody's thinking about them. Uh, because they promise to repair and fix a lot of human maladies, particular diseases uh, of uh, congenital origin, meaning things that you inherited from your parents or your family, or you know, just accidental insults from the environment, injuries, and those kinds of things. So here's a picture of a hematopoietic a stem cell. And you can see this stem cell um, has essentially two properties, which are fundamental and are shared by all stem cells. Number one, these are cells that produce progeny that are like themselves and also unlike, that, like, unlike themselves. So for example, when they copy themselves, this process is referred to as self-renewal. So the cell divides, one of the cells will actually go and make itself again, and this is called self-renewal. Uh, and then the second step is what happens to the other daughter cell. The other daughter cell will actually go on and not become a stem cell, but will go on to differentiate. So here's an example of the types of differentiated cells that these stem cells will make. These are blood cells. So our entire blood system is fueled, completely fueled, by this type of biology. Stem cells that reside in the, um, in, inside our bones, in the bone marrow of our bones. And these stem cells will actually go and do the self-renewal that I'm showing you here, and produce these various cell types that you see right here. 
there's uh, lymphocytes, there is polymorphonuclear lymphocytes, etc., etc. It's, it's a broad and wide diversity of cell types, which keep us alive and defends our body against all kinds of uh, insults from the environment. So that's what defines a stem cell. It's self-renew, and it can produce cells that are different from itself. Okay? So where are these stem cells? Well, stem cells in the human body are in many places. And in fact, I believe that not all stem cells have been discovered residing in our body. For example, the list just keeps on growing and growing. They've been found in the central nervous system, or the CNS. They are in an area of the brain called the subventricular zone, uh, which is in, inside of the uh, brain separated by the corpus callosum. They're also being found in the uh, hippocampus. They are found in the olfactory system. This is one of the few neurons that actually regenerates after, you know, they're damaged by a very strong smell. They'll actually grow back. They are found in the hematopoietic system. That's the blood system we just discussed. In the skin, every time you go to the beach or to the pool and you get sunburned, you lose the skin, it grows back. That's all driven by stem cells. Muscle, if you exercise, uh, which I think you should be doing, uh, then what happens is that those muscle fibers will die, but they are resident stem cells that will actually go on to repair those tissues. The digestive system and many more. Okay? So uh, this just keep on appearing. When people look and look and look, they keep on finding more and more stem cells. And it's not entirely clear where they, where they all come from during development. And it's a very um, active uh, area of investigation. So that's what stem cells are and where they are and what they are likely doing uh, for, to, to maintain our, um, our biology. But the process by which they do this is referred to as tissue homeostasis. And tissue homeostasis is essentially pictured in this slide. So you have a stem cell, which actually undergo self-renewal, which is this little arrow you're seeing right here. That cell will actually now produce a daughter cell. Now, this daughter cell can actually do one of two things. It can amplify itself, which you can see down here, so it makes more depending on how many more cells are needed by the tissue. Or it can actually go from this individual uh, all the way into the tissue in which it's going to integrate itself. So this is a good example. An example of uh, tissue homeostasis is given by when you eat a very, very spicy meal. All right? Say you go to an Indian restaurant and you ask for extra hot. Okay? Well, that extra hot is actually going to kill a lot of the cells that line your gastrointestinal tract. And this is what, you know, the sensation that you get. Those cells are killed by this compound called capsaicin, which is found in red hot peppers. And what happens is when the cells die, somehow, from mechanisms we don't quite understand, they send signals to these resident stem cells and tell the cell, hey, we just lost a differentiated cell. We need more. Because if we keep losing cells, we'll lose our, our integrity, and you'll get more than a, than a stomach ache. You'll get an ulcer. Okay? So what happens is that the cell will go on, intercalate in this tissue, go back into the tissue, and then differentiate into an epithelial cell. And this goes on over and over. So the tissue homeostasis refers to a process by which our organs can keep an optimal state of being. This is our, these are uh, situations that are required by phys physiological changes. So tissue homeostasis is essentially the process by which you are repairing physiological wear and tear, whether it's in the lining of your gut, or whether it's in the muscle, or whether it's in your skin. This is just normal wear and tear, and you don't really run out of these uh, tissues for a long time because you have these stem cells making the tissue anew all the time. For example, you know, the lining of your gut, just to give you an idea of how immense this process is, the lining of your gut, if you were to like spread it out on a thin surface, a single cell layer thick, okay, that will cover the surface area of a tennis court. Okay? That is being replaced in your body essentially every five days. This is a remarkable thing that your body is doing every single day. There's a constant replacement of these cells. And so, and the fact is that when it happens, it doesn't happen in a disorganized fashion. It happens in an incredibly organized and choreographed fashion such that the structure of the gut is retained, such that the function of the gut is retained. And these are processes that are still quite mysterious to a scientist and is, again, a very um, active area of, of research. Okay? So that is essentially uh, how the, um, uh, the process of tissue homeostasis uh, is uh, conceived of uh, uh, by, by, by scientists. Well, how can we measure this? Is it really happening? So I'm going to give you a really good example of a manuscript that came out in 2005 by Spalding et al. that actually took advantage of these atomic explosions that I told you about. So what happens, if you look at this graph, is that from the beginning of history, dating all the way back to like 0 BC, all the way back to the 2000s or so, the amount of carbon-14 that was in the atmosphere is very, very low. You can't see anything before the first atomic explosion. Right around here, you see this huge peak going up because these were atmospheric explosions. In the atolls of the Pacific, in Arizona, and New Mexico, these things were being blown up 
uh, to test uh, you know, how powerful these reactions were. So what the scientists did was the following. They reasoned that since DNA is made out of carbon, because we're carbon beings, we could actually measure this carbon-14 in individuals that were born somewhere around this period, and then see how quickly this carbon-14 disappears from their tissues. So they did this first with plants, okay? Just to show you that this is really conserved for all multicellular organisms. So here are the rings of a uh, plant. You can see that. This is how we actually measure, you know, the age of this plant. So each ring represents a particular year, or a particular decade in this case. And what they did essentially is that they went into each of these rings and collected a little bit of sample, loop, 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 put them into a, 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 a tube, and then process them to detect the amount or the concentration of carbon-14 that these uh, tree trunks had. And again, if you follow down here, before the first detonation of an atomic bomb, the carbon-14 is very low. But afterwards, it just goes up. Now, it goes all the way to the top, and then it declines. Why do you think it declined? It declines because treaties were signed to prevent explosions of atomic weapons in the atmosphere. And most of the explosions that were tested from that point on were, were underground. So the carbon-14 actually decays through time, and it decays through time simply because the tissues are turning over. So you can see that when we go back to the 2000s or so, right over here, um, what you see essentially is that um, the carbon-14 has dropped. So now they reason, well, is this true for trees? How about us humans? So this is what they did. They went back and they looked at populations of humans that were born somewhere in the 1950s, 1960s. That would be somebody like me. And then they measure what the amounts of carbon-14 were in these individuals through time. So if you have tissues that are turning over very, very quickly, the amount of carbon-14 that you'll find in those tissues will be very low. But if the tissue is static and it's not changing very much, the amount of carbon-14 will be very high. So here's a collection of what they found. So here's Google Man, this guy you can find in, in, in Google. I don't even know if the, the people know that um, his picture is uh, all over the internet, but we use it for, uh, for teaching anatomy. And so here's the situation. Cells of our, our body turn out to turn over at very different rates. This is still more complicated. So for example, in the brain, the cells appear to be turning over in years. It's not in days, it's not in hours, it's in years. That kind of makes sense. I cannot imagine, you know, keeping the same personality if all of my neurons were changing uh, daily. Just think about that for a minute. Uh, tissues of the heart, for example, are also not turning over readily. So it takes years for them to turn over. Uh, the liver, in 300 to 500 days, most of these cells have turned over. So there's a very, very quick drop in the, uh, in the uh, carbon-14 that was found in these tissues. Uh, skeletal muscle, in months, you're turning over these tissues because you're using them all the time, obviously. In blood, it's about 120 days uh, for red blood cells and uh, five days for the uh, gastrointestinal tract, which is what I just mentioned to you uh, earlier. So that essentially tells you one thing. Uh, for example, I am 49 years old, but I know now that the average age of my cells is anywhere between seven to 10 years. So even though I, as an individual, am 49 years old, I had cells that were just born yesterday. So how old am I, <laughs> right? So these are things that we need to understand. How do you integrate old with new and how does that integration result in functional activities that are normal? And we really don't know what these processes are underpinning uh, these events. All right. So when uh, um, Lewis Carroll wrote in Alice, uh, Alice's Adventure in Wonderland that at least I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have changed several times since then, even though it was supposed to be nonsensical, it's actually true. Oftentimes, fiction is truer than we think. And so we are really constantly changing on a daily basis. And uh, it's important for us to think about this biology in these terms as a dynamic uh, process. OK. So the second to last topic that I want to cover with you is regeneration. Now, why do I want to make a distinction between tissue homeostasis and regeneration? The distinction that I want to make is illustrated by this next slide. It actually involves injury. Here's a situation where I'm using a razor blade to amputate a planarian, which we're going to talk about in just a few minutes, into three different fragments, okay? So when you actually <clears throat> are just undergoing normal physiological wear and tear, and those tissues are repaired by the endogenous stem cells, you're not really introducing a physical injury that uh, was introduced by a blunt force or something like that. That usually happens in regeneration. And some organisms, as we'll discuss in a second, are really good at repairing themselves after such types of, uh, uh, of injuries, okay? So here's a planarian. You can see the head is up here. You can see the nice little uh, eyes over there. There's the trunk right here with the pharynx in the middle, and here's the tail down here. And what we're going to do is that we're going to follow each of these fragments through time. So here's uh, the times. This is day one, day three. 
And this is a marker that we use to measure cell proliferation and then day seven. So if we look at the head, this is what happens. You get an animal that heals its wounds. By the third day, you see this little white tissue sitting right here at the bottom that's referred to as a regeneration blastema. If we look at that day by mitotic activity, we can see a lot of cells dividing right near where this amputation plane was. And by seven days, the animal has essentially repaired or restored the tail. That's fine for a tail. What about the trunk? It has to regenerate both head and tails. And so what it does is essentially the same thing. It forms this uh, wound um, um, healing at both ends, the blastemas at the head and the tail. We now see proliferation at both ends of the animal. And eventually, you get a head and a tail, essentially restoring the anatomy of the animal. And the same thing is true for the tail. The tail will actually go on to form a new head by the same process. So regeneration activates this population of stem cells to produce all of the different cell types that are required to restore or regenerate all the missing body parts that were lost to amputation, OK? So obviously, you and I can't do it. I mean, not, not like a planarian could. I, I think that the French already demonstrated with their French Revolution that decapitation of human heads does not result in the growth of a new head. Proof over and over. However, this does not mean that just because we don't do it, and only, only a few animals do it, it's just a rare event. It turns out to be extremely, extremely broadly, but unevenly distributed throughout nature. You can go to simplest animals like anemones, for example. You can cut them. They'll regenerate. You can actually look at things that are a bit more complicated, like an octopus, for example. Those tentacles can be amputated. They'll actually grow back. Snails, their heads, for many species, can be decapitated. Those heads will actually grow back as well. And so these are animals that are fairly complex and have essentially all of the tissue types that you and I have in our body. You can go to animals that are closely related evolutionarily to us as vertebrates. These are sea cucumbers. And they'll do something remarkable. When they are attacked, what they do is that they literally throw up their entire gastro gastrointestinal tract such that the attacker can eat its guts. And while the attacker is eating its guts, the sea cucumber just crawls away. And then after a few weeks later, it regenerates its entire gastric system. So this is an example of uh, adaptation in which regeneration plays a key role. Then, of course, is the champion of regeneration, which are these uh, axolotls and, and salamanders. These are endemic to Mexico. And these animals have been amputated in a variety of ways. Uh, the limbs will regenerate. The digits will regenerate. The jaw will regenerate. These little um, uh, gills right here will regenerate. The tail will regenerate. And in many other species, people have tried to amputate parts of the heart, which will grow back, uh, kidneys, et cetera, et cetera. So their, their, their capacity of regeneration are truly, truly astonishing. And this is a vertebrate. This is an animal that is similar to us in the fact that we're both uh, vertebrates in that case. Now, you could argue that the reason why this happens is because all of these animals right here you know, are small, and they live in water, and then maybe they're not terrestrial animals like you and I, and they're not as big. But I think that the most remarkable example of animal regeneration happens in a very close relative of ours, uh, which are the ungulates. These are the deer. So any of you who live in the western part of the United States would have seen this. Every summer, or every, or every spring, these animals will actually shed their antlers, and they'll grow them again. And it's not like they're just growing a nail. They're actually growing real tissue. So these antlers fall off, and a regeneration blastema, like the one that I show you in, in, the, in the planarians, will form. And these blastemas will be vascularized, meaning that they will have blood uh, circulation going through it. They will be innervated, means that there'll be neurons in there, and it'll be ossified, and the bones will grow. And so when this actually grows, and it grows incredibly fast, then what happens is that all of the soft tissues will undergo cell death. They fall off, and now you have these beautiful antlers. And they do this every year. So it's not like mammals cannot do this. They can do it, but we just don't know why we can't do it. So we like to understand why that's so. And so here's a tree of the uh, Minnesota tree of life. Uh, the phylogeny is showing you in green all of the phyla that, in which regeneration has been described. And the ones in black, it's not that they don't regenerate. We just don't know uh, whether or not uh, they regenerate or not. So with all of this remarkable biology, how can we get to mechanisms? How can we study stem cell functions? So I'm just going to go through a few slides now to give you an example of how we actually try to tackle this problem using uh, planarians. The first thing that you need to understand is that whether you look at a planarian or whether you look at, at, at a budding yeast like this, the amount of genetic information that's shared among all individuals on this planet, all living forms of this planet, is extraordinary. Uh, for example, there are mutations that you can introduce into this yeast, and it will actually cause malfunctions in the, uh, in, the, in the fungus, in the yeast, and it'll just not do well. It'll die. However, you can take DNA from humans, put it back into this yeast, the same genes that you and I have, put them back into this yeast, and rescue that mutation, and rescue the viability and the life of this yeast. 
How is it possible? Well, it turns out that there's about 100 human disease genes that are found in our genome that can actually rescue the corresponding yeast gene mutation. If you think about this, the evolutionary distance between humans and yeast is not a couple of days, it's about a billion years. So how could these functions be so incredibly conserved, so deeply conserved between such disparate uh, individuals? And that's because these principles of biological uh, development are actually uh, shared by most organisms. So what we can do then is to take advantage of the stem cells that are found in humans, take advantage of stem cells that are found in other organisms like planarians, compare the genes that regulate both of these processes by uh, looking at their DNA, and try to understand how the cells do what they do, and then try to learn about uh, this uh, biology more about ourselves. So I'll give you an example. Uh, here's a situation where we can actually change the fate, I mean, what the cells are going to make after amputation. So what we do is that we take advantage of what's known as a signaling pathway. In this case, the wnt beta catenin signaling pathway. And you can look this up uh, in, in, in your textbooks. So what you see essentially is that I'm going to talk about two things, the activator right here and the inhibitor of this pathway. So this one is what's going to affect the functions. If we get rid of the activator uh, by a process known as RNA-mediated uh, genetic interference, or RNAi, what we see is, uh, is, is quite remarkable. So here's the normal situation, the control experiment. You amputate the animal, and then what you see is what I've shown you before. Each of these individual animals will actually go on to make uh, the missing body parts, OK? So that's the first thing. If we now get rid of this activator, the beta catenin molecule, now crossed out by red, uh, what you see is that we amputate the animal, and now instead of getting animals that regenerate a head and a tail at both ends, they regenerate heads at both ends. We essentially just change the fate of what these cells can make by simply eliminating this particular molecule, this beta catenin. Now, this is a very old signaling pathway. You find it all the way down from jellyfishes all the way to humans, and this conservation is absolutely astonishing. Now, we can also do the following, which is, what if we allow the activator to accumulate by eliminating the inhibitor? So we do that experiment, and essentially what we do is that we get rid of the inhibitor, allowing the activator to accumulate, and when that happens, then uh, after amputation, this is what we see. We essentially see that the animals, instead of now regenerating heads, they regenerate tails in bo at both ends. You can see that right there. So that suggests to us, then, that this particular pathway is absolutely re uh, required for the maintenance of the head and uh, toe, so to speak, and head and uh, anterior posterior axis of these organisms. Now, amputation is not what activated this particular pathway. You can actually do this without cutting the animals. So we can now get rid of the activator again, not cut the animals, and now you get animals that essentially grow heads almost everywhere where there is a dorsoventral confrontation, at the edges of the animal right here. Okay? So I want to conclude by uh, essentially driving home the following points. Uh, the first is that understanding of stem cells in vivo is really limited. We really don't know what these stem cells are doing throughout the process of embryogenesis, throughout the process of fetal development, uh, during post-birth, growth, and old age. These cells are playing roles in all of these stages, but we don't know with precision how they do what they do. Secondly, we need model systems to overcome these limitations of knowledge. Clearly, we should not and will not experiment with humans, but since this biology is so deeply conserved between us and every other living uh, organism out there, we should be able to, to learn lessons from these organisms on how they do what they do. Um, next, I think that many organisms, including planarians, share this high degree of genetic homology with humans that is going to allow us to understand our own biology by just simply studying these uh, particular processes. Uh, then it's also possible, as, you, as I show you, to manipulate the in vivo function of these stem cells and their environment in organisms like planarians, particularly uh, other model systems that can regenerate and use stem cells to do this. So there's an enormous breadth of biological activities that can be uncovered in these model systems and extend, again, to our understanding of our own biology. And finally, I think that model systems like planarians really provide unique and unexplored opportunities to understand stem cell biology and their roles in tissue homeostasis and regeneration. So with that, I'll leave you uh, with this thought that uh, there is much to be learned out there. There are many things that we don't know anything about and that much work needs to be done in order for us to begin to understand not just our own biology, but our relationship with other organisms and biology at large. Thanks very much.